Welcome to Space Apps New York. Yes, applause, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'd just like to say hi to everybody. Uh, welcome to the kickoff party uh, for uh, Space Apps New York. Uh, we are very honored to have uh, Ron Guerin in the house, Astro of Astro Ron Twitter fame, uh, real NASA astronaut. Uh, so uh, we're going to keep it pretty short and sweet. This is a very informal gathering tonight. Um, we're just here to you know to say hi, uh, to enjoy a few drinks, and to meet prospective partners for challenges tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, my, I'm Mike Caprio. Hey, how are you? <laughs> nice to meet you all. Uh, I'd like to actually also point out uh, Alice Eng. She's uh, right here in the front. Co-organizer Alice. I don't see NC if he's around. There he is. All right, come out, come out, come out. NC of Valley NYC. And Jason Saltzman, also of Valley NYC. Uh, Justin Isip, there he is in the back, waving his hand. Another wonderful organizer. You've all seen our names on the emails. Uh, so yes, as I said, we'll keep it short and sweet. Um, we will uh, have a few words from, uh, from Ron. He's got a presentation for us. And uh, I will just hand the, uh, the mic over to him. Thank you. So first, I, I want to, everybody who's participating in the Space Apps Challenge, I want to um, thank you. Thank you for being here. This is going to be incredible. This is, well, I'm not sure if this is true, but I've been told this is the biggest hackathon in the galaxy. But we, we can't prove that for a fact. But we, we, what we, I think we're pretty confident it's the largest hackathon in the solar system. So we, to date, have, uh, let's see, over 40 countries, over 80 cities uh, on all seven continents, and about 8,000 people participating at this point. And so this is the second time we've done this. The first time uh, was about a year ago. It was very, very successful. Um, and the reason why we're so excited about this is our world right now is producing data at just an incredible rate. And so that is an opportunity. That's an opportunity for us to use that data for good, use that data to improve life on Earth. And events like this and your goodwill and your ab abilities and your talents and your generosity with those abilities and talents make use of that data and, and, and make the world a better place. So it, I'd like to um, kind of reinforce that big picture uh, perspective. It, would it be okay to share some pictures and videos that I've taken in, in space? Would you get? Would you guys be okay with that? <laughs> All right. Cool. So, like I said, I want to uh, re reinforce the, this big picture perspective. And and all the pictures. I think most of the pictures, if not all the pictures that you'll see, were pictures that I tweeted down when I was uh, on the space station. And this one, um, I. The tweet that went with this is from space, even Yankees fans and, and Red Sox fans are next door neighbors. So I, I retweeted this a couple days ago as well. So from space, you can see how everything looks, looks beautiful and peaceful. Um, so basically, I want to pan back from the, from the worm's eye view, past the bird's eye view, all the way back to the orbital perspective. And I, and I want to share that with you. And I want to describe to you some just absolutely amazing experiences that I've had the opportunity to, to uh, take part in that have really shaped this perspective I have of our home, this perspective I have of our planet. In 2006, I had the, uh, the privilege of living and working on the bottom of the ocean for 18 days and 18 nights in Aquarius, the world's only undersea laboratory. Uh, in 2008, I launched to the International Space Station on Space Shuttle Discovery for a two-week construction mission. And in 2011, I took this picture of Somalia and Ethiopia and Yemen as I spent a half a year living and working on board the International Space Station. And I sp spent that half a year after launching from Kazakhstan on a Russian rocket with two Russian guys um, on the 50th anniversary of the first human space flight. And to me, that was a really profound example of international collaboration that you have three military officers, one from the US and, one, and two from Russia, working together as a crew uh, to go to an international space station built by 15 nations was uh, really amazing. So what I really want to share with you tonight 
um, kind of as a token of gratitude for, for all the work that you're going to do this weekend and all the, the uh, contributions you're going to make is to share the orbital perspective, share this perspective we have of our planet. And rather than um, just trying to describe it to you, I want to show it to you. And I don't think it's going to really show up uh, that great um, with the lights on, but we'll do the best we can. Um, this, is a, this is a picture I took uh, of Space Shuttle Atlantis as it was coming aboard the space station on the last mission, the last uh, space shuttle mission. And I, I uh, looked down and I saw the space shuttle. We were really busy, but I had to get a quick snap because it was right over the Bahamas. And as you can see, it was, it was pretty beautiful. But about a month before I returned to Earth, I flew to the cupola on the International Space Station. The cupola is this windowed observatory on the bottom of the, of the station. And I wanted to take some time-lapse pictures for a, a video that I was putting together. And some of, the, some of those images you'll, you'll see in a second. And when I, when I was taking these pictures, something caught my eye. And this is a picture of me in the, uh, in the cupola uh, of the station. And in a picture was a, a illuminated line that was snaking across a large landmass for hundreds of miles. Um, and this is um, the picture right here. And this really intrigued me. I didn't know what this was. And uh, initially, I wrote it off as maybe strange exposure of moonlight on a river. Um, but it turns out that this is not a natural reflection at all. I've always been one of these astronauts that sa says you can't see any borders from space. Apparently, I'm wrong. Because what this actually is is the man-made border between India and Pakistan. And seeing that had a, a, a profound effect on me. You know, for the 50 years that humans have been flying in space, astronauts and cosmonauts have commented on how beautiful, how tranquil, how peaceful our Earth looks from space. And, and it really does. I mean, these are not cliches. It is truly moving to see our planet from space. And the point is not that we could look down and see a man-made border between India and Pakistan. The point is that we could look down and feel empathy for the struggles that all people face. We can look down from our orbital perspective and realize that each and every one of us is riding through the universe together on this spaceship that we call Earth. That we're all interconnected, that we're all in this together, that we're all family. And when we see the beauty of our planet, we're really faced with a sobering contradiction. On the one hand, we could clearly see the beauty of the planet we've been given. On the other hand, is the unfortunate reality of life on our planet for a significant portion of its inhabitants, those that don't have clean water to drink and a food to eat, the poverty, the conflict that exists on our planet. And when we look at that line, I mean, to me, that line is an example of a barrier to collaboration. And this event that we're having here is one of those events that, that breaks down those barriers of collaboration. And so I'm going to try and show you the, um, some of the, the videos that we, the, the time lapse videos that we took. It's, I think it's going to start here in a second. But I, when I launched into space in 2011, I launched with a belief that we have all the technology, we have all the resources necessary to solve the problems that we all face. And so if that's true, you know, I believe that we live in a world where the possibilities are only limited by our imagination and our will to act. So we have to ask ourselves, if we do have the technology, if we do have the resources to solve the problems that we face, why do so many critical problems still remain? And so when I was up there for six months, any available free time that I had, I spent with my face plastered to a window and pondering that question. And I believe the primary reason why we still face so many critical problems despite of our ample technology, despite of our ample resources, lies primarily in our inability to collaborate on a global scale. What you're seeing in this video is the global scale. It's a scale where man-made and natural boundaries shrink. It's a scale where individuals and organizations and governments set aside their differences and work together towards their common goals. We now have the technology to enable true global collaboration that is consistent and world-changing. The real challenge is demonstrating just how vital, how valuable, how powerful collaboration truly is. The good news is there is millions, literally millions of organizations around the world working to improve life on Earth. The bad news is, for the most part, these efforts are not engaged in a unified, coordinated effort. There's a great deal of duplication of effort, loss of efficiency, and in many cases, unhealthy competition. And while we're watching this, um, you know, these are the auroras, the, in this case, the southern lights. Uh, the flashes of light you saw were um, lightning. 
um, and we're about to see one of the 16 sunrises that we see every day. Uh, you can see the solar arrays tracking the sun, even though the sun's on the, uh, on the other side of the Earth. So we, we really do have a beautiful planet, a beautiful home. So I'll just make a couple of quick points, and I, I think the first one's obvious. We don't have to be in space to realize that any one of us does not have all the pieces of the puzzle and that we need each other. Uh, we don't have to be in orbit to realize that by working together and being open to innovative new ideas, uh, being open to innovative new partnerships, that radical solutions can come from different places. Ideas are highly overrated, and uh, I think I'm preaching to the choir here because what I mean by that is you know, every great achievement starts with a great idea, but ideas without action are, are empty. And you guys, all that are participating in the Space Apps Challenge, know that because you are participating, you are uh, a part of the solution. Um, but every great achievement certainly uh, requires a great deal of dedication, a great deal of effort, a great deal of hard work, but it also at times requires stepping outside of our comfort zone, step inside, stepping outside of the way we've always done things uh, engage innovative partnerships like you find in the International Space Apps Challenge and look for those new solutions. So just do it. Um, you know, the, the, the problems that we face on our planet are seemingly insurmountable, but it's precisely those people who make a commitment to make a positive change, and it's precisely at those moments where they have the courage to step outside of their comfort zones. They have the, the courage to, to acknowledge the fact that they don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. Not, no single person, no single organization, no single country is going to be able to solve all these problems, uh, and we're going to have to work together to do it. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures because although you can't see my feet, I always imagine that I have one foot in, the, in daytime and one foot in nighttime in this one. Nothing is impossible. So not only is every great achievement at first seemingly impossible, uh, it's usually seemingly crazy. And you know, for, for all of human history, for the thousands of years uh, before the moon landing, people thought that it was impossible to fly to the moon because it had never been done before. But we proved that it was possible. Human ingenuity and the determination of the human spirit prove that today, many people think that it's impossible to solve many of the problems we face. For instance, they think it's impossible to lift the entire population of the planet out of poverty. They think it's impossible to solve diseases like cancer. Um, but if we can land on the moon and return safely, if, if 15 nations can join together, can set aside their differences and work together to build an enormous, incredibly uh, capable research facility in orbit, then we can, by working together, solve many, if not all, the problems that we face. Nothing is impossible. So the first step to having real change is to believe real change is possible. And, and I just want to share with you um, personally what I, what, some of the things that I believe. And I believe that it's possible to live in a world without poverty. I, I believe it's possible to live in a world where everybody has access to clean water and nobody goes to bed hungry every night. I believe it's possible to live in a world that educates all its children. I believe it's possible to live in a world where no one dies from completely curable and preventable diseases. And I believe that we do live in a world where the possibilities are only limited by our imagination and our will to act. So what's the key? The key is we. And that's why, that's why I flew up to New York to be with you tonight, because I want to thank all of you who know the key is we, that are pitching in. Nobody's getting paid. They're going to work, you guys are going to work long hours the whole weekend to try and come up with some solutions. Um, and like I said, the key, the key is, is demonstrating just how valuable, just how vital collaboration really is, despite the real and perceived risks. There are risks to collaboration that we have to overcome. And I believe that by clearly demonstrating that, we will show that it's in everybody's best interest. And we will, sh you know, the true, open, transparent collaboration, besides solving the problems that we all face, I think is also going to be a tremendous economic engine. And I think that those organizations that are engaged in unhealthy competition, secretive dealing, um, corruption, uh, that take an unhealthy uh, proprietary mindset are going to see themselves being left behind and are going to have to adapt, evolve, and take on a much more cooperative and collaborative mindset in order to keep up with the economic growth that collaboration, true open collaboration, will bring. 
open, transparent collaboration leads to better solutions through the pooling of resources uh, and information. Uh, working together multiplies cost effectiveness and reduces duplication of effort. It's the only real way to have uh, economies and solutions of scale. And probably most importantly, true, open, transparent collaboration leads to better accountability, which fosters trust. So we're all in this together, and the only way we're going to get through this is together. And this is a picture on the 50th anniversary of the first human space flight. Um, it's uh, the six, six of us crew members that were on board at the time, representing three different nations. And you know we have a lot of problems, despite the fact that we've been working for many, many years to solve these problems, uh, like finding a cure for cancer, like alleviating poverty. And I believe that the reason why we still have those problems is because over those many, many years of working on those problems, we did not effectively collaborate together. We did not effectively work together. But we had an excuse then that we don't have anymore. Up until very recently, we didn't have the tools to enable worldwide global collaboration. We didn't have the tools that connect 80-something countries and 40, uh, no, I'm sorry, 80-something cities and 40-something countries and 8,000 people around the globe to work on some of these problems. We do now, and we don't have an excuse anymore. So a couple of initiatives um, that I want to touch on real quick that are trying to do just that. One is Fragile Oasis at uh, FragileOasis.org. And this is an initiative to use this orbital perspective that we have to inspire people to go out um, and make a difference and make the world a better place. And it's uh, also a platform for collaboration. Um, Unity Node is an effort uh, to unify various initiatives around the world that are trying to build universal open source platforms for collaboration. Um, and I encourage everybody to, to check that out if you can. And I think you guys all know what this one is, um, the International Space Apps Challenge. So um, I'm going to try and stick the microphone on the speaker and see if this works. But this is a picture of us a couple of days before launching in, uh, from Kazakhstan. And uh, I just want to leave you with this question. All right, it's a song that says, what kind of world do you want? <laughs> So I'll just leave you with um, thanks, first of all. Um, thanks again for, for being here and for all that you're doing and all that you will do um, to, to make the world a better place. And I'll just leave you with, you don't have to be in orbit to, be, to have the orbital perspective. And by working together, we don't have to accept the status quo on our planet. So thank you for being here. And I, thank you. Thank you. So I did want to open it up for, do we have time for questions? Absolutely, okay. All right, no questions. Anybody have a question? Yeah. The video that you show, is that the real speed of the spaceship? Or you yeah, good question. Is, is the video the real speed? No, it's, it's sped up. Um, but it, interesting, the, the lightning, the frequency of the, light, of the flashes and the lightning is very, very accurate. And the reason is, is because you know, we're, we're only taking like a picture every three seconds, or every, it's a still camera that's just taking pictures every few seconds. And so, um, even though it's sped up, it's, it's only capturing a fraction of the, of the lightning. So, um, it basically, you know, lightning storms from space look like paparazzi um, flash bulbs going off, or, or a strobe light almost. It's really a, an amazing, amazing thing to see from space. Yeah, I know. Like in the, the space station, it's like you stay there so, for so long and it's your gravity environment, the muscle degenerates. So how do you mitigate that? So how, how do we counteract the effects of, of living in microgravity for, for months on end? Um, that, that is a really, really big problem. That, you know, the human body is just absolutely amazing. It rapidly adapts to any environment that we put it in, but unfortunately not all of that is good. So after you get into space, your body rapidly realizes it doesn't need a skeleton anymore. And <laughs> so you start losing bone density really, really quick. Actually, um, we lose, I was told that we lose bone density 10 times faster than a 70-year-old osteoporotic woman. Um, and th that's good, though, in a way, because we are the guinea pigs for osteoporosis studies. 
Uh, and what we found, we we found some, um, um, you know, nu nutritional countermeasures that, that we can use. But really, the the best countermeasure for us as astronauts is exercise. And we are required to to work out two hours a day every day. Um, we have two treadmills on the, on the space station. If you don't know, is huge. It's this enormous orbiting complex. And there's two um, treadmills. We have to obviously bungee ourselves down to keep us on the treadmill. We have uh, two stationary bikes, and then we have resistance equipment, like um, you know, like it, it's a, a vacuum tubes, basically that we're that we're pushing against. And so we do an hour of aerobics and an hour of weightlifting every day. And I came back with no bone density loss um, at all. So that uh, that is really really an effective countermeasure. So there's bone density concerns. There's uh, muscle uh, atrophy concerns. There's radiation exposure concerns. So we're having to solve all these problems before we go to, you know, on to Mars or wherever else we're going to go in the solar system. Yes, sir. Uh, why did you choose to become an astronaut? Why did I want to become an astronaut? <laughs> <laughs> I know why not. But <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm old enough to have watched the uh, first moon landing. And um, that day on July 20th, 1969, I knew that that's what I wanted to do, and I worked my whole life. But it's interesting, um, when I got to high school, that I lost that dream. Um, I, you know, I was living, living up the road in Yonkers, and um, this was after Skylab, and it was before the first space shuttle mission. And for, from some kid from, from Yonkers, for some kid from Yonkers, we didn't have a space program. So I went off to college not knowing what to do. Uh, the day after the first shuttle launched, I went into my advisors and said, how can I start taking math and science? So um, I, I can personally attest to the power of the space program to inspire students to study math and science, which, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we have a lot of problems on our planet, and a lot of those problems have technical solutions, um, and we need people studying those topics and those subjects to, to help solve some of these problems. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have a perspective on the privatization of the space industry, specifically with, um, you know, the change going on at the Kennedy Space Center and the forthcoming SLS platform. Okay. Do you think that's going to help advance uh, space research? Yeah, so um, views on, on space commercialization. So I, I think it's absolutely critical that um, we involve commercial activities in space um, I, for many, many reasons. I could stand up here for three hours and talk about it. But basically, in a nutshell, what the, the large government uh, organizations are, are suited for is having return on investment that you won't see for many years, if not decades, down the road. And, and a lot of commercial activities are not going to do that. And so we are at the point uh, in our activities in low Earth orbit where I mean, we still have a lot to learn, but we're at the point where we feel comfortable that commercial activities can take that over to enable NASA and the other space agencies around the globe to you know, see what's over the next hill and start pushing you know, exploration. Uh, and start, you know, basically jump-starting that. So I think it's really important. I also think it's important because I think the more people that get to see this, the better off the world is going to be. And I hope someday soon we have the International Space Apps Challenge with, with a, a location with the public in space. So, uh, and that's very possible. I mean, it, I think that uh, in our lifetimes we're going to see uh, a lot more people, you know, an exponential increase in, in people being able to fly in space. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Okay, so if anybody has uh, any questions about uh, tomorrow or uh, wants to you know, just talk about anything, just feel free to, to ask now and uh, I'll try to answer whatever I can. We're still waiting on details on some things. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, so, what we plan to do tomorrow is um, we're going to allow, we're going to have uh, posters up on the walls and you'll take a post-it note with your name on it and you'll just put yourself next to that challenge. So we're going to have people gravitate to areas where the challenges are organizing. It's a fairly organic process. Um, but basically, uh, you'll talk to people, you'll meet with people, we'll have um, some posters up on the walls with the challenges named on them and you'll just take a post-it note, you'll congregate, kind of gravitate in those areas, and just talk with folks. 
Um, so we're going to have a, a little bit of organizational time tomorrow morning around 11 a.m. and um, you know decide on what kind of solutions you want to do. If two groups form from that, that's totally cool. Um, it's all kind of how you want to approach the challenge, what kind of solution you want to make for it. So it's just a question of finding people you have chemistry with and, and all agreeing on one particular solution and then forming a team. Yes? Do you have to submit our solutions like on the project concept tonight or? Uh... No, not at all, not at all. Um, you may have noticed if you went on the spaceappschallenge.org website, there is a submit your team kind of uh, thing. You can do that if you have people. You may add more people later. Um, it's not entirely necessary to have any of that done right up front. The submissions process will happen on Sunday. It does involve putting your stuff on GitHub. So again, it is very important that everybody have a GitHub account and a Twitter account and a Skype account. Um, uh, yes, go ahead. Is there going to be one team for project? Oh, the question is, will there be more than one team for a project? There absolutely can be. Um, in fact, not only can there be more than one team per project uh, here, you can also have members from other countries working with you. So part of this, like, you know, like Ron said, is it's about international collaboration. Um, you know, that's what Twitter is going to be for, Skype is going to be for. Um, one of the things we'll talk about tomorrow uh, when we're all here and we all have our laptops and stuff, you'll see that each challenge has what's called a hack pad. And a hack pad is a collaborative, a collaborative notepad kind of like a Google Wave, if you, if you remember what that was like, or like a, a collaborative wiki. So people from other countries will post their data. They may post solutions, links to things that they've done. So you, everyone can co collaborate and, and work on things that other people work. So someone, someone in Abu Dhabi right now could be writing code that you could use on your project tomorrow. So that's, that's again, the spirit of international collaboration. So anybody else? Yes, all the way in the back, speak up. <laughs> Um, we'd love it if you guys could come in at 9. We're going to have breakfast. Um, so uh, absolutely try and get in. Um, you know, the doors open at 9. Yes. So uh, doors will open and the food will be here and we'll have coffee, freshly brewed coffee, uh, thanks to Pushcart Coffee. Uh, tonight we are wrapping up uh, at about 9 o'clock, so we've got a few more minutes for people to chat and, uh, and mingle. Um, but we're, we're, we're not starting tonight. Um, we, we didn't want to kind of have anybody starting tonight just because we didn't want to have any issues with people feeling, oh, you had more time than I did to build stuff. I mean, that's not, that's not this isn't about a competition. Like, we, we do, we will recognize two teams that form here uh, for global judging. So every site will pick two teams and then there will be a process over the next couple of months where uh, judges at the global level will pick you know the winners of the winners of space apps at the global level, um, but again, it's not. You know, we're we're here to change the world. Anybody else? Yes. How would you go about judging if I use like some tool? Like if a team works with another team on another site, who gets the credit? So it, it's. I mean, everybody. We're all going to get credit because we're all awesome. Um, the local judging is. We're going to have judges here. We're going to have two rounds of judging. Um, so really, it's at the local level. Think about it that way. Like you're amongst these folks here, that's where the credit is coming from. Like we're going to pick two from this whole group of people to go to advance to the global finals. So, I mean, it's it's this is about collaboration, not competition. So everyone gets credit who contributes. Anybody else? Okay, so um, please feel free to enjoy some more of our drinks, and we'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning.